Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, Mary McGill has a wonderful, phenomenal show. And um, if you haven't looked around, please make sure that you read all the stories. Uh, we're just going to jump into asking, uh, when and how did you become an artist? Well, since I was a little girl, I mean really. I mean, I, I remember taking art lessons as a child and loving it. And then uh, I was married young, and I had three children, and then I was a mom for, uh, of course you're always a mom. But uh, when my kids hit high school, I realized that I needed to have something more, and I sold real estate, and I did other jobs, but uh, I had a passion for interior design, so I decided to finish a degree in interior design. And while doing that, the, I had to take a drawing class. And the drawing class was right next to a ceramic studio. So I would watch them, and I was mesmerized, and I liked the whole situation going on behind me. And I thought, I'm gonna take that class. And so I went on, got the degree for design, had a job during that, and he did it. I loved the design part, but I didn't like having to tell people what to do in their houses. <laughs> so I um, just kept taking classes. And I continued to take classes probably for 10 years. And I just soaked it up and I learned how to run kilns and I learned about chemicals. And I had a little bit of a studio in my backyard, which was a gazebo. And um, when it was hot, you'd be really hot. And when it was cold, you would shake because the water, I was throwing a lot and the water gets super cold, but I knew I always wanted to have a studio. But it just never worked out, and then um, when this became available, you know, I jumped on this, and I couldn't be more happy than where I am. Are any of your children artistic? <sighs> uh, I would say they're all artistic, but they um, are all making a living right now. So I have two children in finance, and my daughter works for Facebook, and I think that Charlie's actually filming a live video for Facebook so she can watch. So, hey, Allie. <laughs> but uh, my one son is, is a writer, he can write. And uh, they're all artistic, but no one's making a living in the art world, definitely. So can you give us um, a quick summary of your show, um, Art of the Story? Well, Art of the Story, is stories, and they're my stories. Um, each piece is written at a different time, or is made at a different time, and it's the story of what, it, as an artist, I don't know how you can't tell a story with your work. You always, I don't care what you're, if you're painting, sculpting, you're, what's going on in your life is in your work. I, I don't know how to be any other way. Um, I don't necessarily want you to know what the story is, but I want you to recognize that it's always a journey. And that's all we're guaranteed in life is the journey. And I just, what I like is for people, for it to resonate, and I like the conversation. And many is the time that I have a piece in a show and, and I'll ask if I'm there, I ask, you know, what do you see in it? And they'll tell me, and it's so far from anything that I would have ever known, but that's, Perfect. That's what excites me. I like the conversation, and I like that it starts the conversation. So, for me, that was it. And, um, you know, the Misfit Cup Liberation Project just <laughs> fed right into the entire part of the story. And I, uh, this was not my idea, this is an idea from an artist named Michael Strand in North Dakota, and he um, started this, probably maybe four or five years ago, and it has gone around the United States, and um, different artists have carried it forward. So I called him a year and a half ago when I applied here to have a show, because you don't just get a show, you have to go through a process, and I, uh, I called him and asked him, you know, is, would he mind, and he said, thank you so much for asking, because mostly people don't ask, they just do it. <laughs> so uh, I was got his blessing, and I was very happy for that, and then, I kept the idea in my head, and then when I, I realized I was having the show, uh, I thought this is going to be perfect. But then I had to think, well, how am I going to get these houses? Because they <laughs> that's a situation in itself. 
And luckily for me, I have a good friend who's here, Rachel, and her husband is uh, just an amazing person. And he offered to make me 50 houses. And if you look at the houses, they are in themselves works of art. And I was saying, Howard, you're doing, they're too nice. Like, you know, but he, this is how he is and this is what he does. So um, thank you, Howard. I think they really um, set the mugs off so perfectly and the stories off. So um, then I threw 50 mugs to go into the 50 houses. And it's nice because it, you know, keeps the words and the stories perfectly. I couldn't be more pleased. And Howard and Rachel also helped, and my husband, with hanging these. You know, it was how do we want to do different rows? Do we want it to go all the way around? We thought that this was really effective. Yeah, great. Yeah. You can start anywhere. Do you have any questions, anyone, about anything that I'm talking about? Please interject. <laughs> So in your statement, you talk about um, your sculptural work continues to be female and feminine figure or feline figures within pottery vessels. Um, can you talk about why female figures and why feline figures and do they connect or are they completely separate? Well, the women, the feminine, or what I know, <laughs> being a woman, um, and I am comfortable sculpting the women, and I just really enjoy, you know, for this one example, her story is the butterflies, and because for me the symbolic lesson of the butterfly is that, you know, it starts as a caterpillar and it goes through metamorphosis and it changes gracefully and accepts all the changes that occur in your life. And so I use butterflies a lot. I, I use them on my bowls too. I don't know that I have one here with butterflies. Yes, I do. So again, it's all the symbolic pieces that I add to the work. Um, now, the cats are a different story. The cats are really men. Uh, <laughs> So they have crowns, <laughs> and um, they think they're kings, and uh, sorry, honey, that's not a statement about anything to do that. Um, this kitty in particular, uh, this one called Carnal Thoughts, the gray and white kitty, I don't know if you noticed that um, his carnal thoughts are rats and birds. That's what's right. in his head. And so it's just symbolic of, you know, different thoughts that we all have in our minds. Um, you know, I just, uh, again, they're telling stories. And that's the part I like about it. When you start off with a cat or a figure, is it a person that you're thinking about? Or is it just kind of this made up creature that you're sculpting? It's a made up creature. It's not any person other than myself. And it's not you know, um, and certainly not myself. So it's it's just, it's my mind, it's my emotion, it's whatever I'm going through at that time. Um, the totems are different. The totems all um, are telling stories also. Uh, this, two of them are part of a series. They were actually, they were, the top, um, I call them beads, are Winds of Change. It was a series called Winds of Change, and it was all based on um, a picture that I was shown from a, a, a really close friend who was ill. And so I, I loved the picture of the hair flying, not caring in the world, and that was what it was all about. And there was three pieces in the series, and she's topping this totem, and the other one's over there, and then someone who's here today had bought the other sculpture. So. Uh, it's all changed. It's just what was represented to me at that point in time when I was making them. May I ask a question? Yes. When you begin, do you have in mind what it's going to look like when it's finished, or does that evolve as you work? A lot of times I've read something, and that sparks the feeling inside of me, and then um, it never gives me what they're going to look like. That just kind of happens, but the uh, emotion and what I've read 
and or what I've seen or a poem or something or like a picture. It just sparks that part of me and um, and then I just go with that. Are you sometimes surprised at the end? Sometimes this I'm horrified. I'm not always surprised. Sometimes I'm horrified. <laughs> this is where I'm going. <laughs> sometimes I think, oh my gosh. <laughs> sometimes they never make it out the door. <laughs> Especially in ceramics. That's uh, Ceramics is um, never ending in terms of learning. Uh, running the kilns, the chemicals of the glazes, the, uh, you know, there's this, always a surprise. I don't care how many times I fire, it's always different. Like, I never understood the glazes and such. It's, it's all what's going on in the atmosphere of the kiln. And um, I fire with a gas kiln, an electric kiln, and a raku kiln. And those are three different fires that give me three different surfaces. So, um, my biggest kiln is a gas kiln, so if I know if the piece is going to be really large, then I'm going to have to glaze it a certain way. That's the only parameters that I have in terms of what controls the final outcome, is if it's a really big piece, then it has to go into my biggest kiln. And even then, um, sometimes I wish I had a bigger kiln, like because I could make it bigger, but I have to still be able to pick it up and move it myself and get it into the car, even though I have a lot of people that help me. Can you talk a little bit about how the totems are constructed? Because they're just amazing feats for ceramics. <laughs> and it's always a surprise. Um, okay, there's you know there's a piece of uh, rebar inside, and again, Howard, uh, Rachel's resident husband, Howard Miles, helps me. Um, he, you know. He, the fire and they well for me. <laughs> but I'm gonna learn how to do that. That's something I would love to learn how to do. But uh, he'll, you know, weld the rebar on there or whatever it is. But these actually come apart because they have to be moved and you, as you know ceramics are extremely fragile. Uh, so I all these pieces of the totems can come off and then um, I pack them and then they go to wherever they're going and I reassemble. Uh, you know even though ceramics is fragile, it's very strong. You know, it is vitrified and the clay is strong when it's fired. Uh, you can't smash it, but you can certainly stack it. So that's what I do. I mean, I have, um, certainly as part of design, for me, I'm always looking, and this is with anything that I do, I'm always looking at balance. The balance in my brain is the most important thing, scale, and just making sure that they look like they're balanced to me. That's what I do. Hey, me, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand about the woman and the hair falling and the in change, but a couple of your pieces in the series feature a house. And so, what's the significance of the house? Home, family, and each one. Yeah, just that you know, as mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, you know, it, it's homes. You know, they almost all. In fact, they probably all do have homes. Yeah. Can you, re can you rearrange the? Is this like set? You designed it like that, but or do you? Can you mess around with it? Say maybe I want the big one on top and the little one in the middle. And yeah, I, I mean she the, the this topper bead to couldn't be, be yeah rearranged, but um, there are beads in my brain. Each piece is a bead, and so um, you know they could definitely be rearranged because actually as I'm making it. They can't be stacked because they're until they're fired. They're not strong enough to stack. So I might have in my mind, you know, but then they're always. It's always difficult, and I usually have to uh, throw something else or make something else to fill in because it's not quite, you know, working. So there's no welded. No, no, they're all separate. It's just oh, the the bar. Oh, the, that's it. Okay. Yeah. In fact, the rebar is not even welded in. The thing that holds the rebar on the bottom is welded in, but the rebar comes out. Yeah. Going back to um, the writings that are along the wall with certain pieces, mm -hmm. can you talk about how you discover these writing pieces? Are you always reading? Are you looking for things? Or do they just kind of discover you? They discover me. Um, I don't. I mean, gosh. 
as an artist, it seems like I'm always looking at images and I'm always reading things. And my kids, two of my kids live in uh, New York, so I, I almost find, I can't wait to sit on that plane for five or six hours when I go see them, because nothing can interrupt me on the plane. You know, I, 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 there's no emails or texting or anything like that, and I will just save up the things that I want to read for the plane. And, um, you know, I, I go quite often to see them. So that I just read and, and look, and things just jump out at me. Uh, with this piece right here, By the Book, I knew that, um, you know, I, I thought, oh, I want to put a book on this torso. And then I thought, well, what am I going to write in that book? Because you just can't have empty pages. And then when I saw this um, poem or statement or whatever, and I think it's unknown by an unknown author, I that's perfect. Because a lot of times, like I said, they're telling my story. They're telling how I feel um, in my life and things I've been through and such. And, that's, I thought that was perfect for that piece. I love what it says. Do you do any writing yourself? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you share it with anybody or is it with any of your pieces or is it just private? Well, I'd say it's with a lot of the pieces. Almost every piece here has writing somewhere, but sometimes it's inside of it and um, you don't see what I've written or, you know. A lot of times there's words on there, but they're obscured. So, yeah, I, I write a lot, but I don't necessarily want anybody. Mm -hmm. so one question that um, I think is really interesting with your uh, female figures is, and I, I don't think you have a lot of functioning vessels. Not here. Not here, but um, sometimes she does them with... Um, where it's a female figure within a, a working vessel. Uh, how do you see those in a feminism discussion? A feminism, if feminism is defined as equality, as we're all equal, then, you know, I'm a feminist. The vessels, um, again, are the story of all, especially the female vessels, of all, all women everywhere, as wives, mothers, every, every function that you have as a woman is um, it's feminism. I mean, I just, I, you know, they're just, they're just me. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really kind of all I can say about them. I, I just enjoy making them and I enjoy giving them life and giving them personalities and as far as the ones that are functional, that's, you know, an added bonus, <laughs> I guess. Do you see those as decoration or working pieces of art? The work that's here or the work that's the, the the vessels? Fun functional? Yeah, or the bowls. You know, they're both. Pardon me? No, I was just thinking there's, I don't see bowls. Right oh, behind you. Oh, yeah. I see oh, we moved the bowls. Yeah, okay. yeah okay. they were in the middle of the room. Yeah, there's one back there. Okay. Some of them are very functional, and some of them are not, only because their glazes are too, uh, you know, chalky or, you know, they're not, it's not a food safe glaze. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't, can't put, you know, candy in them or something like that, wrapped things. But, you know, bowls are. Vessels, and you know, they're like sustaining life to keep the bowls. Mm -hmm. So, you talked um, about the butterflies. What other pieces of symbolism do you use throughout the pieces? I know symbolism is really important to you. Are there other things? Sure. You uh, the um, birds, you know, are freedom and life and. Mostly all the symbolism is that kind of thing, where it's, you know, it's almost always representing home, family, life, uh, things like that. The butterflies are change. Um, circles are all encompassing. Some of my women have open heads because there's information that's still coming to you. Um, you're open to having new things happen to you. Um, what else do we have? The, 
woman over there, Carrie, the piece behind there, she has, um, she's holding vessels, you know, she's carrying, and it's not just water, it's carrying everything in life, you know, because that's what women do, and things like that. I'm just looking around, thinking, what else do I see that, you know, that is that? But those things. We mentioned the houses are symbolic. Yes, the houses are symbolic. Mm -hmm. The wall pieces over on this wall, um, can you talk about that? Because that is so different than everything you have in here. And I haven't seen them before in your. Well, maybe I have. Uh, yeah, I have several masks. I have another series inside my studio. Uh, this. Uh, series. There's more to that series. There's only two up. Uh, it's called Surgeon General. <laughs> because I don't know if you can see the one is smoking. Um, you know, just what happens when you, you know, smoke. Your skin gets a little rough. <laughs> you know, if you look at them. I love to make the clay have texture and I love to see how far I can push it before it rips and I like that's also you know as an artist I the aesthetics for me are important and that's what I'm doing with these masks but that is called the series is the Surgeon General and it's just a statement on smoking and uh, you know the bad parts of it I have another series um, of masks uh, called don't hate me because I'm beautiful is what they're called and that's really a statement they're pulled they're they're, they're wired up, um, they're just every, you know, the faces are going every which way. And that's a statement of plastic surgery and what women start doing to their faces, then they looked better before. So, you know, it's, it's more just, they're just my personal statements of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> which is interesting because that is talking about a feminist conversation within your work. Probably more than, <laughs> than I knew. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, I know. I'm, I'm discovering things today, Catherine. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the bases on your cats. Okay. Because I, I don't think a lot of people really look at those, but there's a lot of information on them. A lot of the bases have the stories on them. Uh, certainly the bird in the hand, the, the crown with the cat with the feathers. That entire, the story above his head is written of kings and crowns all the way around the base of that piece. Um, you know, just for me, it was another way to raise the work up, was when I started making bases. And uh, originally I started making bases that were round, and people were saying they, they look like a cake. You know, and I was like, <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> no, we don't want that. We don't want kitty jumping out of a cake. And so, uh, no, then they started going square. But, you know, it's just part of the learning. Um, you know, when I start a new uh, series of work, whatever sparks my attention, um, you know, the first one is never the best one. They, they grow and they get better. And I learn from each one that I make. And then I will get done with it. That's what I like to do. With your work, are you thinking about scale? Because to me, when I walk around, I really feel like your pieces, you can't ignore them because they are, your cats are larger than life or your totems are almost human size. Are you thinking about that when you're making the pieces? I'm thinking that I want them as large as I can make them and still get them, still be able to pick them up. I just like the scale. Mm -hmm. I just like <clears throat> them to be noticed and to be a statement. And I. I, you know, I'm that way with uh, paintings too. I, I like large paintings. I don't like them to be small. I like them big. I don't know why. I just I like the scale to be large. I like to see the statement and um, it, for it to be noticed. I mean, I certainly do have some small work, but it's probably it's mostly it would be the beginning of the series when it's small before I've gotten confident with it, and um, that's just my particular thing. You've established a number of series, so what are you working on right now? I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure a lot of the artists here, uh, that are here, uh, I um, worked pretty hard to have this. Uh, I wanted it to be cohesive and I wanted it to work. Um, and this is kind of the end of um, it for me right now. 
I mean, of course, I'm going to, I can't wait to start looking and reading and thinking and about what I'm going to do next. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Maybe I'm going to, I, you know, I still love the cats. I mean, really, the cats started from um, T.S. Eliot's Book of Cats. Uh -huh. And just, if you read that book, and I mean, just the whimsy, and, and, and that's probably what started those cats, and then they just take on their own life. But uh, I, that's the kind of thing that sparks it. And as of right now, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next. Not yet. What do you plan to do with your cups that you've got and the stories that have come with them. Oh, that's interesting. I don't have a concrete plan at the moment. I, uh, you know, it, there's there's always the option that it can be shipped off to the original artist, who this is kind of a massive type of situation. Um, but I don't know that I'll be doing that. Uh, some people have expressed that they want their cup back. They can certainly have it back at the end of this show. The stories I will do something with. It will go into, I have a number of friends that are painters. I feel like we're going to do something with these stories. You know, that are, they're going to go into something, some kind of a piece of art. Now the houses, um, I hope to bring this on to another gallery. And I'll throw 50 more cups. And, um, you know, I hope to continue this on. That's what I hope for. Well, is there anything else you want to share? I have 50 little houses. No, I, I hope that you all see something in the work and something that resonates with you. And how? Yes. Hi, Mary. Hi. Thank you for, for doing this. I have a question, since I know a girl who does large pieces also. Uh, <laughs> how long would you work on a piece that big, like the totem, for example? Oh, well, the totems, yeah. Approximately. From start to finish. <laughs> months? It takes months, yeah. yeah. I mean, because you start them, and then you you fire, and then some things work, and some things don't. and. Uh, for the totems, you know, at least a couple of months yeah. from start to finish, if not more. But I don't just work on one thing. Right. I work on many things. Yeah. yeah, whatever strikes me. So, you know, kind of. And then, you know, they change as they go along. Like, you know, this, the top of this totem used to be somewhere, a uh, different piece of work. It used to be its own sculpture. And, um, you know, I was looking at it, and, and I had made these beads, and I thought, you know, this would look good together. I think that's going to be the top of that totem. And so that's kind of how that went. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, that is what happens. They change. That's great. And then I know when, I, I know when it's right, um, and then I can be finished. But, you know, they're not always right. But that one's right. So I'm just happy with that. Thanks. Yes. How does the work change now that it's in a gallery space and not in your studio? Oh, it looks so much better. <laughs> because in my studio, it's, you know, it's dusty and very full. So uh, I like to see it lit. Uh, I'm happy. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I was very happy to see how the show was hung and everything. I was very happy. Does anyone else have questions? Yes. Um, of course, these are the only two cats I can see close up, but the, the larger one looks very, the emotion behind the eyes looks very regretful or possibly sad. Is that um, something that you were thinking about as you were creating the expression on this particular cat? Are you talking about the, my cup runneth over? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Probably. <laughs> um, I mean, the eyes are really. Yeah. They they say a lot. I'm glad that you see a lot in them. You know, it was. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad that you see the emotion because they all have a lot of emotion in them. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> I I've noticed that uh, on on your sculptures and your bowls and uh, like for instance the. The torso with the book on top. Uh, 
There's a lot of uh, delicate work, and it, could you talk a little bit more about the risk involved and the consequences of working in layers and with some of the feathery, delicate type of uh, arrangements you've done? Sure. Um, there's a lot of consequences uh, dealing with layers of clay, and as Kathy knows, the, uh, I'd say one of the biggest situations that I get with some of my really, if I get really thin with the clay, is it gets very sharp, especially when it's been glazed. It's glass, and you know, I don't like when they cut themselves on my work, so I go over it. Um, with some of the work, it's, it can get, get thick, especially these bowls, because they're layered, and I do try to get my layers as thin as I can, but I like the volume. Um, and all kinds of situations occur at 2200 degrees in the kiln. Uh, you know, they can crack. I just threw one out, two out the other day because I got too fast and I have to let them dry. You um, learn really hard lessons in ceramics uh, and just what you have to, you can't push it the way to your timetable. You have to kind of let it do. And, and again, it depends on if the weather's been really wet, you know, it's very, it stays damp, it's difficult. And you think you can put a hair dryer to it, but you're only drying the surface and it's not dry inside and that's even worse, you know. So it's a matter, uh, I'd say one of my biggest lessons from ceramics, uh, being a ceramic artist, which I now is 20 years, um, has been uh, learning patience because I'm a very impatient person and I want it now and I want it right and you know and it doesn't always work that way. <clears throat> My husband's very <laughs> smart. I want it now and I want it right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Mary, when, how long did you put the show together? A year or half? Year? I had uh, a couple of the pieces um, Maybe two pieces were past work, but the rest is all new, and I knew what my concept was. And so after I applied for the show, which was probably a year and a half ago, I knew that I would be going in that direction. And so I tried to make, uh, I wanted to make all new work. I mean, that was what my goal was, definitely. Mm -hmm. So it's about a year, a year and, and a half? half. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. As a um, student of yours, I know you don't do anything without thought. So when you made the 50 cups, did you have anything in mind? I mean, were you thinking maybe, you know, she might like that or this reminds me of someone? I had a lot in mind when I was making the 50 cups because um, one of the arts of a coffee cup, coffee cups are themselves little pieces of art, um, was uh, size of hands. And so I wanted to make a mixture um, you know, I have really small hands and I don't like a mug that has a handle that is going to slip on me, you know, because it's too big. But some men have really big hands and they need a big handle that they can fit some fingers into. So that, I tried to just make a mixture. You're not seeing all the mugs here because there's not, I mean, these aren't my mugs. I mean, you know, just the ones that don't have stories attached or what I had. So that was really what I was trying. It's really the art of the handle. Some were big and some were little. And, um, well, as you know, I do love to pull a handle, right? Yes. yes. My class is, that's a demonstration. It's not so easy to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I like a pulled handle, and they're, I tried to give a mixture for everyone to be happy. What is pulled? Mary, tell us that handle. Some of us aren't in on that show. <laughs> it's nice to be seen. When you're pulling a handle, um, or, okay, um, when you're making a coffee cup and you're going to be attaching a handle, you can just cut, there's, there's actually tools that you could just cut that handle and it would be the proper thickness and such and you would attach it. But there's an art to having a piece of clay that's in the shape of a carrot and you uh, literally pull the clay um, over water, a bucket of water, because your hand has to stay slippery in order for it to just get longer. And it just is, it's a process. So um, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yes, it's a process. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a handle. <laughs> <laughs> the little nails and the night we hung these houses, um, you know, uh, my husband's a CPA, Howard's a builder, um, you know, Rachel was here. 
No one could figure out, like, we must have done the calculations. Oh my God. Not me, I never would say I could do the calculations, but the men, we were all trying to calculate the space, and we kept messing it up. It was ridiculous. But then once they uh, had how far each house was going to go apart, uh, Howard had a laser, you know, that helps hang, and so then they just marked it, and how are they nailed, we just nailed them. And then I put little things of uh, two-sided tape to uh, on the backs of them, yeah, to just get them to not be too shifting too much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for coming. Yeah.